Nationalism is the concept that cuts across the entire community. It's a call for the forging of unity, a call to our heritage. It's a call to struggle to liberate our people here in the Southwest. A man who has been speaking on Chicano nationalism since the beginning of the crusade for justice. A man who is looked up to by all militant organizations in the Southwest. A man who is especially appealing to the youth. Un hombre como los de aquellos. Un hombre de coraje y responsabilidad. De orgullo y dignidad. Máximo representante de la Cruzada por la Justicia de Denver, Colorado. Rodolfo Corky González. espiritual de Aslan desarrolla el tema que el chicano, la raza de bronce, debe usar su nacionalismo como la, como la llave común para la organización en masa de la gente y sido cometido a la idea y filosofía del plan de Atzlán, podemos solamente concluir que la independencia social, económica, cultural y política es el único camino hacia la liberación total de la opresión explotación y el racismo. Por esto nuestra lucha de ver por el control de nuestros barrios, nuestros campos, nuestros pueblos, nuestras tierras, nuestra economía, nuestra cultura y nuestra vida política. El plan compromete todos los niveles de Sociedad chicana, el barrio, el campo, el ranchero, el escritor, el maestro, el obrero, el profesional, los compromete a la causa. The plan de Aslan was written first, the spiritual part was written by poets was written by beautiful people of compassion, written by young men who recognize that liberation comes only when people are brave enough to stand up and call themselves a man or a woman. And it plan, 
After we got through with the conference, the young poets, the young minds got together and come up with a plan espiritual de Atlan. And then we came up with a program, a program to control ourselves, a program to liberate ourselves, a program to make Chicanismo, Cardinalismo, a real living thing, a program of love, and at the same time, a program of real existence. So we have to look at the total life. We have to look at ourselves, and we have to look in the mirror, and we have to wonder who we are, and we have to tell ourselves the truth. And how many of us can? How many of us have all those hang-ups that the gringo has placed on our back? We can shout, Viva la Raza, and wear boycott buttons and still help the man out. We can shout liberation and still be oppressed and still be a slave to the man. So the only way that we're able to really come together and really cut all of the fat off and really bring our minds together is by looking at ourselves and saying, who are we? What do we want? We want 350 horsepower Thunderbird. We want to look like somebody stepped out of Esquire. We want to look like somebody stepped out of Vogue. We want to kill ourselves to have yellow hair. We don't want to walk in the shade so we don't get as dark. <laughs> you know, we have to start analyzing what this gringo society has done to us. And we're finding out faster than they are in our fatherland, Mexico. Because the green fingers of money and exploitation are now strangling Mexico at this moment. And the tomatoes that they say are coming from Mexico are coming from gringo agribusiness to defeat the farm worker, the campesino, and his efforts to organize. And you see any of the latest cines de Mexico that most of their actors are blonde, they're leading people, and they don't know they're being jibed. They don't know that psychologically they're starting to destroy them. And psychologically they're starting to put racism into Mexico to where El Indio is a second class citizen and the Mestizo is a second class citizen. Y el Blanco Rubio is a powerful, strapping, successful symbol. And that's what they've been bullshitting us about all these years in our school books. And they've been telling us that all the success symbols are white. And all the success symbols are gringos. And they've been denying us our culture, our history, and our contributions. And we've been allowing it. And we've been going over there and trying to act like somebody we're not. And we've been trying to, some of the cats are even trying to sing like James Brown, you know, because they're not identifying with their own culture. What's all right, soul music is beautiful. And we should be able to integrate that and enjoy it. But Chicano soul music is beautiful too. And then we have the other cats who are trying to act like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and walking around like Steve McQueen and John Wayne you know, trying to identify with somebody they're not, allowing this society to castrate us and to make us less a man. Because anytime you don't know who you are, anytime you don't know where you come from, anytime that you deny your mother and your father 
And the cat that don't have no father, you know what he is. And any time that you deny your own identity, you don't know who you are. You have no value, you have no worth. And that's why it's very important, it's very important that we speak in the colleges. Isn't it rather odd that most of the cats you've been calling to rap at all the college symposiums are not college people? You're starting to get some college heavies, and you're having them up here. Cesar Chavez is not a college graduate, nor a college movement person. Reyes Tijerina didn't come off a college campus, and I didn't either. You see, the reason I want to talk to young people in the colleges is very important. We don't come here to try to glorify ourselves. If we influence and if we create something, that's a satisfaction that anybody that can write poetry, paint a picture, play a song, make music and make love, anybody that can create, that's a satisfaction. And we want to create out of the young people an understanding of who you are and where you owe your leadership to, your ideas, your bodies, your brains, and your professions, and that you have to take them back home. And the college student has been isolating himself from the barrio. In California, I see one of the most advanced student movements of college Chicanos in all of the United States and the Southwest. I see the most advanced movement and I see the most depressing movement within the community. And there must be some reason that there is not a communication, there is not an involvement. The college student cannot carry the banner of La Causa, of the problems of the barrio, as his banner and ever associate with the barrio. And we can. And they cannot intellectualize the farm workers' problems and be proud and happy that he's liberating the campesino by wearing a boycott button. He has to become active in helping, active in organization, active in making sure that he spreads the message and he preaches and he teaches wherever he goes and that he, one man, is la causa, one man is the message, and all of us are la raza, and that each one of us start to come together and understand that we're one people. Because we're responsible. Forget this stuff they tell you in the schools about the individualist can make it as long as he conforms to society. <laughs> that's why we get so many vendidos walking out of these colleges with degrees and diplomas because they say, I made it and baby, I'm escaping. And they use that thing as a boat and row themselves right out of Raza Town and Razaville. And they don't look back until there's a Chicano Studies program and then they come back and say, I'm the man, it's paying twice as much as I'm making now. You see, <laughs> we cannot fall into the bag this administration knows, and this establishment knows, they know that as the Mexicano gets mad and starts to move, and if he ever nationalizes and organizes, he's going to be one of the toughest people he ever tied into, one of the toughest groups. Because the Mexicano is a guerrero by nature. And when he finds this out, and he knows it. And this is why the mass media doesn't say nothing about us. The mass media doesn't tell you that the Brown Berets were bombed. The mass media doesn't tell us that the arena was bombed. They don't tell you the crusade was almost burned. They don't tell you that 
two farm workers, nonviolent organizers, are butchered by the Texas Rangers. They don't tell you that two revolutionary brothers, and let's change our opinions and our points of view, that those acts of the people of the barrios who have to face the changos day and night are acts of revolution and not criminal acts. And when there was one wiped out in mission, that was a revolutionary act, and give it some grace and give it some pride that those young boys will go down as political revolutionary heroes, not as criminals to rot in a prison. And you understand, you understand that we have been jived into looking at ourselves and being ashamed. How long was it before the Mexicanos were scared to walk in a picket line. Or they walked by a picket line, looked the other way. Bad show. How many years ago was it that we were afraid to sit in, to stand in? But one Mexicano on an individual basis would not take a push from any policeman, any pig, any chango in this town. And that's why we ended up brutalized. But also, the rest of the Mexicanos didn't come out and tell that policeman why and you're going to have to face us all. And that's mass movement. And that hasn't been done. And it's starting to be done. I'm happy to say it happened in Denver, where our kids had a blowout. And they put us in jail and maced us and gassed us and a lot of those other little things that happen in demonstrations when you meet these people that are supposedly taking care of law and order macing peaceful demonstrators and picket, picketers picketing for unions and nonviolent organizers and young students demonstrating for a better education. And they mass up all of their white cars and they mass up all of their blue suits and they bring out their gas and they bring out their helicopters and they are taking care of law and order. And crime in Denver went up 23% on the seven-day walkout over there because they didn't have to uh, put up with any changos. They were all down there trying to break the heads of Chicano kids. But the Chicano kids, when they got through with them, had wiped out 25 police cars and put 17 cops in a hospital. <laughs> But the one message that we had been trying to get across and the philosophy we spread of mass movement, mass nationalization, mass thought and philosophy hadn't come about because we were preaching and preaching and preaching. And the only people that came, we helped, and then we didn't see them anymore. Well, 50 young Chicanos from north side, west side, east side forgot all about the gangs forgot all about the barrio differences and came together and wiped those policemen out. They chased 50 of them into the, into the projects, which is 90% Chicano, and 900 Chicanos ran out of those doors and chased the policemen away. And that was finally mass philosophy. You know, that was finally mass movement. And out of those, you know, we say, we listen to the radicals. And we listen to the third world guy, people. And they say, third world means humanity. Third world means love. And we can agree with it. Because the Mexicanos already got all that. He doesn't have to rationalize and intellectualize. He already has it. He already has that warmth and that beauty. He already has that love. You know, so we've been a little too kind. We opened our doors. And they come in and took everything. But we have that concept without intellectualizing it. And then the radical cat says, we must pragmatize and plan. And it's true. You have to have plans. You have to have ideas to, to guide you. You have to have reason. You have to have inspiration. So. But one thing happens. The action gets ahead of all the planning. 
We were planning to educate all the kids in the parks and the barrios, set up little uh, liberation outposts and defense units all across the city of Denver because the police have now become an army dealing against what they consider an army. And they are now passing laws to make it uh, against the law for any three people to congregate. That's an assembly. Uh, if you have the materials for a Molotov cocktail, then that's a violation of an ordinance. So if you have an empty bottle of wine, if you drink wine, I do, in the back of your car and a tank full of gas, then you have the materials and the tools for a Molotov cocktail. So one of our guys said, well, man, the next thing they're going to do, they're going to pass one against rape because we carry the equipment. <laughs> but in all of confrontation with the establishment, the establishment always sets barriers. Now, the fact that you can set up a citizen's arrest and that Reyes de Arena was successful will mean that very quickly there will be legislation against it. Let me tell you that. The fact that we can assemble, they filed legislation against it immediately. They've already put legislation into effect to put policemen on the campuses. You've heard Nixon's statements and his Attorney General Mitchell statements. You hear the police chief statements that they will keep law and order, so that which means that most college students must be thieves, you know, and committing criminal acts and uh, some of these other things, because that's what they're talking about when they talk about law and order. And they're going to put policemen, they're going to put changos into the universities and the schools. They're going to force the school system to become penal institutions. In Denver, when the West High kids walked out, they locked all the Chicano kids in all the other schools. But some of them jumped out the windows. They put policemen at the doors. But kids from 16 and 18 schools walked out to support that one Chicano movement. And that nationalized us. And the police come down on us and beat our heads and maced us and that organized us, it polarized us, and we came together, and it made a big difference. And we didn't have to preach about racism. We didn't have to go around saying, you know, the honky thinks that you're a speck. You know, the honky proves it by showing you Frito Bandidos. You know, the honky shows you by telling you about your history, which means that you were a greasy Mexican that the Texas Rangers shot down and ran down. You know, they keep telling you this. And the guy says, nah, there's no, I don't have no inferiority complex, man. There ain't nothing wrong with me. He says, I've got it made. I make 260 an hour. I'm a roofer. <laughs> and I, I believe in the war in Vietnam because I was, I was in the service. Then you ask him, why'd you go to the service? He says, well, I couldn't get a job. Oh, yeah? He says, why didn't you finish school? He says, well, I, I didn't like it. They didn't like me. So I quit to get a job. You couldn't get a job. You couldn't make it. You couldn't finish your education. But you could pass a test to go to the service. You're really brilliant. You really made it. And they institutionalized him. And he become part of the armed forces. And then he comes back, and he's making 260 an hour, and he thinks he's free. But he can't go to any other joint except the Chicano joint. And he looks at me and he says, and don't call me brown either. He says, I'm a white man. And I told him, man, I says, you're, you're, you're blacker than I am and you want to be a white man. And Cassius Clay's whiter than I am and he's a black man. Now we better, uh, you know, get an understanding about what we are. So we start talking culture, history. We start discussing who we are. And we start understanding that when we really look into our history, we start finding all the beautiful things about us. Maybe everything wasn't beautiful. Maybe everybody wasn't good. Part of us is the Espanol, el gauchupin. 
part of us are the Huertas, and part of us are the, are the Cortes, and part of us is Cuauhtémoc. Part of us is all parts, and we're all, what I wrote in my poem, we're all Joaquin. And we make up La Raza. And we have started to nationalize ourselves and to stop fooling ourselves. That the gringo is not going to give you open doors unless he can control you and push buttons on you. And you better understand that. You better understand that when you sit in and demonstrate for more Chicano students in here, they're going to give them to you, so go ahead and do it. But don't let those Chicano students become some of those brainwashed holders of BAs and MAs. Make them Chicanos. When they come out of here, they know what they're supposed to do and they know their job. And their job is this, that in the barrios, the barrios controls. School boards, school boards who live in the country club area control the educational system and the administration, the personnel, and the counselors, and the nurses, and everybody else out of the school system in the barrio. We say it belongs to the barrio, and it's going to stay there. And it's going to be taken over if it has to be taken over by force, because you have that right. And people say, that's not a good thing to say, man. You know those new laws are passing. But you see, I, I read a lot. I just take those little things that I like. And you know, good thing Abraham Lincoln isn't alive today. He'd be doing time for causing riots and civil disorder. <laughs> you know, because he said that the institutions are made to serve the people. And if they don't serve the people, then the people have the right to revolution and to destroy those institutions. So in the barrios, where the agencies, whether they're OEO, whether they're labor department, whether it is a recreation center, a school, whether it's a church, it belongs to the people. And let the people take it over. And let the Vario Vatos be the defense corps that enforces it through nationalism and love and carnalismo. That's what it's all about. We must control ourselves. And we have to give the Vario Vato, the little guy that's 10, 11 years old, that's being harassed by the police every day, we have to give him dignity. We have to give him pride. There will no longer be any acts of juvenile delinquency. There's going to be only acts of revolutionary acts. And that's going to be the difference. Our kids aren't going to fill those reform schools with Mexicanos for truancy and for violation of curfew or sniffing glue or stealing hubcaps. Give him a cause. Give him his people. Give him the love and give him the dignity to understand that he protects his own. And then you have a man. And then you have women. And then you have something solid. And then you understand, for those of you who aren't too physically inclined to go out in the alley and do it, El Vato is. El Vato is. And he's on that front line. In New Mexico, they have Los Comancheros in the campos. And they're the frontline defense of the people who are being double-talked and pushed away at the welfare offices, are being pushed around in the district courts, are being shoved around with their taxes. And they become the front line. In Denver, it's Los Gallos de la Cruzada. And policemen know there that they do not disrespect us because we do not preach violence. And we don't preach nonviolence. We preach self-defense. And self-defense means that when a chango comes to get rid of you, he has a 50% chance of getting rid of. And that's why you know that when there's a bank robbery, policemen always get there 20 minutes too late. Because a bank robber is a professional, he knows what he's going to do. And he's going all the way. And he knows how to use that piece. So policemen usually get there just a little too late. 
And that's where respect starts to develop. So that when we start to control our barrios and the agencies, and people go around saying, yeah, but you know, you feel bad, you're on welfare, second class citizen, because all the majority society says you are. No, give some new pride to our people on welfare. That is not a handout, that's reimbursement and restitution for all the sweat and blood we've given this society. And then, and then you preach, and then you preach this. Only $8 billion is given to social services and welfare out of the total bu national budget. In agribusiness, the farmers get $38 billion, and they don't call that welfare, for not growing food to feed poor people. Senator Eastman in Mississippi gets $157,000 not to plant cotton in the poorest county in Mississippi, where people are starving, barely getting 60 bucks a month for welfare with five and six and eight kids. And that's not welfare. And Standard Oil gets all their tax depletions, you see, but that's not welfare. They buy tankers under other national flags not to pay taxes. And then if one South American country gets their machismo up and their nationalism up and start to shove the mothers out, what happens? They can call the U.S. Marines to go in there and enforce, enforce a private company on a free, national, sovereign country. And they're the guys that pay to get a man like Che Guevara killed and brag about it in True Magazine. They're the people that want us to breed more little, little Mexicanos so they can give us 42 cents a month out of welfare to educate them so that they can become Green Berets and paratroopers, and they can become special forces, real vatos, real machos, who always have to, you know, when they get out there, then they remind you you're half Indian. Trujillo hit the point. It takes a lot of guts to get out there. But they want us to go sooner or later to South America to kill our mestizo brothers. That's right. Before my son goes, before I pay one cent in taxes, we're going to get the guys who make the orders. We're not going to go down there to face and kill our brothers. One of the other areas that we're talking about, when we talk about control, those people who exploit the barrio, get rid of them out of the barrio. And if they're Chicanos that are exploiting, then make them understand that they're not going to exploit anymore. They're going to become nationalistic or else. And that's what it's going to be. In our town, we have a vendido who has a radio station, really a sellout. This guy is from Mexico originally. And he found out politically that it's easier to say he's Spanish-American over there now. And this is the battle some of us have. Some, a lot of people think they're Hispano without being part Indio. And uh, he has a radio station. And we, when we want an announcement to the people, we send our own radio announcer down to let him know that they we're going to have an announcement about a rally or a demonstration. Because we send a few guys down to see him. And he's very friendly with them. And now we have our own radio announcer for our own announcements, because that's the only Chicano station there is. Now, when we come down to the, we come down to the other things that we're involved with in el plan. That we must have economic control. That we have to start understanding that we aren't the enemy. That barrio gangs have to understand that they're all Chicanos and who the enemy is. And you teach him who the enemy is. You teach him who the exploiter is. You teach him what the educational system is. When he starts learning that, he starts looking over there across the street instead of looking next door. at the guy next door who looked at his chick, and he wants to meet him down the street 
and they're going to kill each other. No, we have to start breaking that down. And the only way this happens is by creating action. And the action comes from learning something. So, El Plan de Aslan becomes a name. It's our territory, it's our liberation. We want it seen everywhere. Write it in the heads. Put it on the underpasses. We're going to put it on trees. We're going to stick it on the bars. We're going to nail it on the courthouse doors. We're going to put it on the forest service. We're going to put it on churches. And if a little kid wants burritos instead of peanut butter and jelly in a, in a Head Start program, he's going to take El Plan de Atzlan to get it with. And it's going to become the one thing that we can start to mobilize around. It's the one thing that we can start to think about. But what about action? Because you see, we plan things, and the action gets ahead of us. Kids that demonstrate in a demonstration end up learning more in three days and seven days than they can in all of the planning and teaching we try to do. And pretty soon, they're the leaders, and they're wrapping the philosophy, and they're directing the movement, and pretty soon, they're changing the whole school system. And they do it. So the first point of El Plan, of Acción, is to get Atzlan on the lips of every Mexicano. There's one Mexicano or a million. Atzlan is there. Get it on their lips, their ears. Hear it on the radio. Those of you who speak, say it again. Spread it. It's ours. It's us. And then, who knows if September the 16th, the birthday of Mexican, Mexican liberation, that one of the biggest and greatest and most directed and organized walkout in the history of this country from Head Start to Head Start teachers to college students to obreros to professionals and workers will be the biggest mass boycott in the history of this nation to change the educational system to relate to us and for us to control our own schools and to direct our own life. And it can be done if we decide today that we're going to do it. And we start to plan and think. And I know and have already gotten confirmation from black brothers who say, Right on. We're with you. And I've had words from the Anglo radicals that are willing to back it up on a support basis because they now realize that we have taught that we use nationalism to create our own leadership, to create our own ideas and our own decisions. So I want to read something to you. And this was written in the 1910 Mexican Revolution by Juan Zarabia. And he said that the publication of a revolutionary paper is equal to the taking of a city. The proclamation of a political plan is the same as the bloodiest combat they form equal parts of a rebellion and are inherent in it. I have never seen, nor will I ever see a revolution without the propagation of ideas as a preliminary and the shedding of blood as inevitable, as the inevitable means of deciding the outcome. And we know this, that when we walk out, when we demonstrate there comes the law and order changos to say, you are violating the law. You don't have the right to demonstrate. You don't have the constitutional right of assembly. And they're going to start using their mace and their blackjacks and their clubs. And they're going to do something else. They're going to organize us. And they're going to show us racism in one day. And they're going to show it to everybody. 
and we won't have to preach to the guy that police brutality exists. And he goes around saying, nah, it doesn't exist. Then one day they split him across the head. He says, you know what? There's police brutality in this town. <laughs> and I'm against it. And I'm for anything you guys are for. <laughs> okay, it'll happen. It has to happen. And if it doesn't happen psychologically, because they know it's already going out all over the country, the school is breaking their back the system to try to meet the demands before we even get to next fall. And that's what we want. But we also want the liberation of our society, our control of our own lives, and the young people have to go out and do it. And if we preach nationalism, let's be sure that we do. You know, let's not talk Chicano by night, rather by day, and sleep white by night. <laughs> I want to add one other thing. I want to add one other thing that's very important. In the past, we've had civil rights leaders and civil rights movements. We've had people boycotting things. We've had people striking for better unions and more money. We've had people demonstrating to schools. And while the adults, the men, were out there, they left their women home, rapping on the telephone about petty gossip. And while he was learning about the system and learning about how to fight it, the old lady was get rid of the whole rasa. And that's the important thing, that we're one people and we're going to move that way at all times. Thank you. Viva Corti Gonzalez! Viva Corti Gonzalez! Viva la Cruzada!